Uh, well, it's just me in the studio, apparently. There's no one else here. What are you doing here? I oh, I'm just here to see if you want some coffee. Tea? Coffee? Do you, do you know where Jamie is? Absolutely no idea. He's, he's meant to be here. He's like 10 minutes late already. I've just been sitting here twiddling my thumbs, waiting for my coffee, by the way. Yeah, sorry about that. I mean, you just can't get the staff these days. Well, look, you're okay last last time. Do you want to do you want to sit down, put some headphones on, get behind a mic? Very well. I need someone. I need someone to talk to. Yeah, yeah. You, you sure you don't know where he is? You haven't seen him? Maybe he's off to get some coffee. Maybe he better be. He's taking over the intern job. That'd be weird. Anyway, uh, why don't you? Yeah, go on. Do do the run. It's episode forty-two. Go ahead. This is Brainwaves episode 42, bringing you the best in board game and tabletop gaming news. I'm Ian Chandler, and this is Ian McAllister. Hello. These are the headlines of the week of 3rd of February 2020. Monolith go beyond common sense. A mythic lawsuit is on the horizon. Board games continue to pay dividends for Kickstarter. All this and more on this episode of Brainwaves. First off, over to Ian. Thank you, Ian. So yes, we covered the Beyond the Monolith campaign in episode 36 of Brainwaves. This was Monolith effectively taking their games like Conan and Batman Batman Gotham City Chronicles and sort of tearing out the core of that game, making a sort of almost board game console. And then they were going to, the plan was they were going to release different supplements for that console different settings for it down the line now they took this finally to kickstarter in january and on the 15th of january uh, they took they started early january and on the 15th of january they cancelled the campaign after raising only 250,000 euros of a staggeringly large 700,000 euro goal they've said that it is now more than obvious that the beyond the monolith campaign offer did not attract enough pledges to complete the project as they offered expansions to the conan game alongside the generic system and it seemed to to the developers that there was more interest in the latter during the campaign so they put up an update in the last couple of days saying they're going to be bringing conan Conan back to Kickstarter with some of the additional material in that campaign. And there's been a lot of talk online, and we'll link to a couple of articles talking about how Monolith have kind of gone a bit far with this campaign, that it was kind of bloated and maybe a little unnecessary. But it's certainly Monolith aren't down and out at all with this. They, they're coming back to Kickstarter, they're bringing more things in here. I mean, what, what do you think about this, Ian? What, does it, did it attract you at all? Because it looked like kind of pointless to me. Yeah, I've got very conflicting feelings about this Kickstarter. First off, I didn't know anything about it whatsoever before it appeared. It's like, I spent a lot of time on Twitter looking at this kind of stuff and it just completely passed me by. They didn't seem to advertise it very well at all. It was just kind of not there one minute and then it was there the next. Yeah, literally the first thing I I saw was someone posting an image and I had to actually say, (laughs) what is that? And they linked me to this Kickstarter that was already 12 to 15 hours in or something like that. Um, Yeah. But I really, really respect their their statement that they just said, look, we're not going to do the false stretch goals. We're not going to do the deliberately low goal. We're just going to set our goal. And if we make it, we make it. It's obviously not paid off for them, but it's it's a real shame that they this shows that you probably do need to game the system, that this approach hasn't worked. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, yeah, they did put out a few interesting statements about like the reason they were doing this was to sort of make more realistic campaigns and show people exactly what it takes to put this kind of stuff out but it seems that people don't want to see that too much and they do like the lo- like the fact that the campaign has funded and that kind of thing that they're more assured that they're going to get their product but it's ju- just another reminder that kickstarter campaigns will not necessarily fund all the time hey hey guys hey guys sorry um sorry we were like i um uh, hi sorry oh ian hi hi nice to see you ian um good to see you again you all right uh, ian's treating you well he's not being too mean is he yeah did you bring me coffee ian said you were getting coffee uh yeah sorry um thing about that is uh i was busy and then something went up my nose anyway so we're doing the news aren't we sorry um I... i'm sorry something went up your nose um i will tell you later uh don't worry about it it's absolutely fine um, I just won't go back into that Belgiuming room. Um, right, what have we got here? Oh, oh, this is good. This is good. Okay, this is lovely. Okay, it's my role as financial correspondent. Oh, yes, let me just slip into the financial hat. Ico Partners, who are a consulting and market intelligence service for online games, 
have published the end-of-year results for Kickstarter in games, which obviously includes tabletop games. Now, there has been 208,355,743 dollars raised with 7,043 projects for the last end, the last year. Now, the highest so far was in 2015 when 7,415 projects were undertaken in the year. Now, in the second half of last year, in the second half of 2019, $95.9 million was pledged on tabletop projects. And for the whole year, it was $176.4 million. So that makes tabletop projects so much bigger to Kickstarter in terms of overall taking, with only about $31.9 million pledged to the rest of the gaming category. Now, if you remember, if you've been on Kickstarter and had a look at the gaming category as a whole, there's so much more there. And yet tabletop projects take $176.4 million in a year. Yeah, I wonder if that's because they succeed more, maybe. Like, I think computer games have a struggle sometimes to fund on Kickstarter. Maybe they, it's just they, they actually fund a bit more. In- interesting you say that because, you know, Last year, there were 4,044 tabletop projects put up on Kickstarter. Now, that's 1,926 in the first half and 2,118 in the second half. Now, that sounds a lot, and it is a lot, to be fair, but it's sadly not all rosy, as the success ratio has now dropped, and now one in three Kickstarters will fail to meet their target. That's a lot of numbers. That is a lot of numbers, and I realise I said it very quickly. Uh, No, no, that's that's quite all right. Uh, sorry, I've been very busy. But what are you, what do you think this is going to say to Kickstarter? If one in three uh, projects is going to fail, is this not so much a wake up call, but a wee notification to Kickstarter publishers going, you need to step up your game? Because look to the left, look to your right, then look back at yourself. One of you is going to fail. Do you want it one to be of you? you? Die! Whoa, 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 Ian. <laughs> Well, one of the one of the interesting things that came out of that report is that the the ICO suggests looking at projects per tier of funding as a strong indicator of the health of the gaming ecosystem. And as it happens, sixty eight projects raised more than five hundred thousand dollars in twenty nineteen, and that's similar to the year before. So it's kind of steady, but not growing necessarily, plateauing a little bit maybe. And yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's still a lot of money, and it's really interesting to see how much bigger tabletop projects are compared to computer games. I didn't. I didn't expect the gap to be quite that large, but it's pretty huge if they're not. If their numbers are correct, I was stunned by the fact that yeah, eighty percent are tabletop games. That's not what I was expecting at all. Yeah, I mean, we know that that board game kickstarters are some of the biggest projects that Kickstarter's ever had, into the millions and millions of dollars, mostly from things like Simon and people like that, like the really big the big boys. Even right now, the Return to Dark Tower Kickstarter is on a couple of million, I think. Just let me check. Yeah, three. Oh no, it's on. Sorry, I I apologize. I got that number way too small. Uh, oh, it's, it's, on, it's on three million. It's on three million dollars. Uh, it's about two point four million pounds ah. right now. Now that is that is trading a lot on the name uh, Rob Davio Restoration Games and the Dark Tower. But still, that's a lot of money. Also, a little bit of a side note. Did you boys ever see the original TV advert for the Dark Tower? It was done by Orson Welles. Fun facts here on Brainwaves. <laughs> I did not see that advert. I'm going to have to look that up afterwards. Uh, Ian, it, it's great. I, th- I think you'll enjoy it. But um, before you know, I send you off to have a look at that wonderful advert, um, I think you've got some news, uh, some legal news, actually. Is that right? This is the news that Pascal Bernard sues Mythic Games. Pascal Bernard, who's the designer of Times of Legend, Joan of Arc, and he's suing the company that ran the Kickstarter campaign for this, and that's Mythic Games. The lawsuit is pretty complex, so we're not really going to cover it, but it involves multiple companies, buying of companies. Um, The core of the matter is really that Pascal had a contract that said he had rights to confirm rule changes for the release of a 1.5 version of the game, and more importantly, is due 6% of the net sales of the game. Mythic raised $2,152,000 of a $100,000 target, so they presumably have the funds to pay the man his dues. Mythic seem to be contesting that Pascal has not sent them a correct invoice and also what is included in the overall sales, such as their add-ons, the RPG add-on, the card sleeves, etc. 
that's pr- that's pretty serious. Yeah, if, I mean, it was so serious at one point that I believe the Kickstarter, ca- uh, the campaign has has delivered, but the page, which is still putting out updates, obviously because it's a Kickstarter campaign and that's what they do, was briefly suspended during December, as far as I understand it, because of this uh, because of this matter. Uh, I believe the legal side of things is still going on. The page is back up and running again, but yeah, it got to a point where Kickstarter were actually looking at it from a is this okay point of view. Yeah, that's quite a big step to be taken against Mythic, who presumably have a business model that relies a large part in Kickstarter. Pretty much. They're one of the big boys we were talking about just a moment ago. So the the French board, um, Union of Designers has weighed in on the issue, and they have said, whatever the outcome, justice will give to this case. La Société des Auteurs de Jeux and the Union of Game Publishers can only remind the importance of paying authors on time and timely respecting the terms of the contract do not confuse turnover and profits for example and that any change of rules made by the editor must be the subject of the author's approval pretty strong statement it's incredibly strong to say that all rules changes must go through the original designer that's i wonder if that's something that exists in french law or i don't i don't know it, it's who know who knows but rest assured if there are any more developments in the case uh the case that Brainwaves will keep you up to date with that because it is very, very interesting. It is indeed, yeah. It's interesting to see such a big company come under legal fire. Anyway, enough of this. On on with the news. So yes, we have an update, as we said we would, on the situation involving the Kickstarter union. Now, we covered this story in episode 36, and now we update in episode 38. This was due to uh, what appears to be Kickstarter's attitudes towards certain employees regarding the formation of a union. Now, there has been some quite strong backlash since these uh, events came out, but news has developed that on the 23rd of January, the Kickstarter workers uh, were voting to uh, form a union. Uh, Unfortunately, the vote won't be counted for a couple of weeks. Now, if this does go through, this will be the first tech company in the United States of America to have a union, which is great, but it's also slightly sad that it is 2020, and this is the first tech company to have a union. In the United States, sorry. But as we said, we would... We would update you, and we have, and if there are any more, we will let you know. Ian, moving from uh, firing people to fires. Yes, indeed. We'll all be aware of the terrible fires that have been ravaging Australia and the huge amount of damage it has done to people and animals and property in Australia. And gamers have come together to raise quite a lot of money for various charities uh, it's one of the things I've always been impressed by when I've gone to cons and there's been charity auctions is that the generosity of the gaming um, fraternity has always been very, very good. So it kicked off with the Stonemaier Games donating $10,834 from pre-orders for their Wingspan Oceana uh, pre-order to a wildfire rescue organization. Wingspan Oceana is the sort of Australia, New Zealand area expansion that's coming out for Wingspan later in the year. You can find a bunch of RPG bundles on Drive Through RPG, where proceeds from the sales of that go to some of the char- charities down in Australia as well. There's some Wizards of the Coast bundles on there, where all the proceeds are going straight to those charities. The thing that kicked this off for me as an article was that there's a local effort here with the Blob that Ate Everything Arkham Horror LCG expansion. Is there? We're going to be running one of those in Edinburgh. Lots of people are going to be coming along. Obviously, there'll be a small fee to join in on that and that will be going to the charities and also there'll be in-game bonuses you're going to be able to buy as the game goes on in order to donate a little bit more money to charity so that's that's happening on february the 23rd and we've other few things we've come across that people point us to very generously on social media there's a 24-hour board game marathon Auric Digital gave all the money from sales of their game on Mars to an animal charity. Uh, Reaper Minis, Pants and Minis with all the proceeds going to the relief. We'll put a link to all this stuff in the show notes. And if you know of anything that is going on, 
has been and just want, needs a little shout out on social media or is coming up and we can direct some people towards, then please do get in touch with us any way you can and we will give that a share on our social medias or give it a wee shout out on the next cast as well. It's just great to see gamers coming together and giving some money to charity. It's a very sad cause, but it is wonderful to see such a, a great outpouring of of people support. wanting to help. Yeah, and support. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. Really, really pleased that's happening. Anyway, from the from the slightly from the slightly sad subject matters to uh, more cheery matters in the world of more mainstream board games, Jamie. Yes, yeah, so we've got a story that comes to us from the Eastern Daily Press about a, a Norfolk toy company in Wyndham called Orchard Toys. Um, this story is quite nice because it's it takes a step back. It's not all very particular hobby board games. It's more of a a general board games. Uh, Orchard Toys makes board games for children and with an educational bent. They have about 800 to 1,000 customers worldwide, which includes Hamleys of London, the famous toy store, and that's about 3 million products being sold worldwide. And they have reported a 14 to 16% growth in the last year. And these games are made locally in Wyndham in Norfolk, using recycled material where they can. And it's quite a nice time for it they're celebrating their 50th birthday next year and and they've won the uk supplier of the year at the toy industry awards speaking about orchard toys the sales director simon prest has said parents are realizing that when a child has been on a gadget when they finished they can be quite low they're drained from playing but with a board game it invigorates them and they're less aggressive it also brings families together to play a game However, we do try and embrace technology as well by linking some of our games to apps. I think that's a fantastic idea. You know, I've I've said before I've always been skeptical about games and apps, but you cannot deny that the impact electronic uh, devices have on our culture, and that's going to bleed into all facets of it, including the gaming culture. So, games for kids that have app integration is a really nice way of keeping, you know, not keeping them interested, but just another avenue into it. Yeah, indeed. And the reason I picked up on this story was uh, I've got a little Google alerts up for board game stories, and this one popped up in my feed was the fact their rise has mostly been driven by board games, this this sort of rise in, in sales. And yeah, it's just a, yeah, it's as Jamie said at the top, it's just a reminder that board game geek and our sort of hobby games are not the be all and end all of board games in general. There's a much wider world out there. And some companies do sort of like, hove into that a bit companies like big potato games that we celebrated recently on the on our award show and a couple of other companies like uh, we were talking about uh, emma studios hooking up with gibson games on the last cast and yeah it's really interesting to see that mainstream board games are also seeing a rise in popularity alongside the rise in hobby games and hopefully we'll see a bit more crossover between those two things It'd be really good yes it, it's it's just very nice to see now ian I believe that in the grim darkness of the far future, there are only puzzles. So this is the news that there is a new es- Warhammer 40,000 escape room by Escape Logic Escape Rooms um, called Immaterium, an escape room co-designed with Games Workshop and based on Warhammer 40,000. Up to five players will be on, on board the trader ship Evadir the Tempestus, and something bad happens to the ship in the middle of a warp transit, which... That doesn't sound like Warhammer at all. No, never. <laughs> they have to escape the ship and the warp. Players will touch, smell, and feel all areas of the ship and everything on it, including a talking servitor, which is a biomechanical robot servant. Escape Logic is based in Nottingham and Leicester, but Immaterium will only be in Nottingham, coincidentally the home of Games Workshop. And when you win that escape room, you are entombed in a dreadnought for your for your services to mankind. <laughs> How long have you been thinking about that one, Ian? Since earlier today. Yeah. I've got more. Yeah, no, it's okay. I'd rather... like, wait, it, it, so if you solve the Emperor's puzzles, you're obviously a heretic and you should burn! I'd, I'd rather you didn't continue. Um... Yep, it's nice to see. It's nice to see Games Workshop expanding. You know, they've mo- they're moving out. They're moving into TV shows. They've already done films, but they're you know they've done a lot of audio dramas with uh, through the Black Library. Yeah, they they just announced a Blood Angels cartoon. Uh, it's an animated show. Co- it's an animated show that was announced last year called Angels of Death, and at the Las Vegas Open earlier this month, fans were treated to a short trailer for it. Yeah, very cool. So and hope hopefully I I mean I I think it's a great idea for. You know, 
cashing in a local business and a local, I guess, celebrity, Games Workshop. And I'd like to see, I'd like to see more. I want to see more. I demand more. As much as, you know, I can, which I really can't. This is such an interesting departure from the previous old Games Workshop of just cash, give me cash now. And like in the last, what, even just five years, Games Workshop has changed to embrace casual audiences so much. It's it's just fascinating to see. It's amazing what a change of management structure will do. Yeah. Indeed. Well, talking about warp storms, let's go to the brainstorm studio and like have we sit down. We've got a question from a follower. Well, gents, this week we have a question from follower and patron Simon Marr, uh, and he was wondering what we would suggest as a good starter RPG for new players and GMs. So, your thoughts, gents, on such a subject? So, I've recently been playing in a new campaign with some completely new friends, um, and one of our friends is running it, and it's Dungeons and Dragons. Um, just we all we'd all previously heard of it and this guy who's running it just got us all involved these are people who are not generally into rpgs as well so basically this was very much an extremely casual audience and it's it's working really well actually cool yeah I, my friend gaz has also been running a new D game for some of his work colleagues and that's been going really well and yeah we're bound to mention this first one like D is just if you say role playing to people and they have a vague clue what you're talking about, they're going to mention Dungeons and Dragons first because they are. It's Dungeons and Dragons. And I, I think I can, I think I might be able to pin down slightly why it might be so. I think first of all, the just the name Dungeons and Dragons, it's got an over forty year history now, so it's it's going to bleed into popular culture. Also, I think it has um, an accessible system that is not too complicated, especially with the 5th edition that has come out for, what, five, six years now? Um, I think it's accessible for new players, but there's a good level of nuance that slightly more experienced players can find, and they can kind of have some fun with that. Another thing I find, especially for new players, is character generation systems. And you can have a whole host of them. For example, there is the Traveller system, which is you're rolling your character's entire life. And that is almost a game in itself. But see if that's the first time you're ever playing a role-playing game and you have to do that? I wouldn't be surprised if you just gave up immediately. I think Dungeons & Dragons is very simple. It has the kind of clear cut. There's a choice of race, a choice of class, and then in 5th edition, a choice of background. I think the other thing it does very well that other companies don't do is there's huge amounts of support for D&D out there. So you will find intro adventures being run in game shops across the country. It is easy to find a Dungeons and Dragons group that will happily welcome new players. Geek retreats all across the country run like new stuff all the time. There's the Adventures League stuff. And yeah, it's very easy to find a game, basically. And everyone's basically running the same game and there's a lot of cool intro products as well there's the star kit the original star kit when it came back out a few years ago and there's the new essentials one as well which has even got like a, a single player mode in it to sort of like learn the game and yeah there's just some really good products out there for it it's yeah it's definitely the sort of go-to for like getting a handle on rpgs but beyond that what do, what do we think guys like sir there's, there's other stuff out there there's other types of gaming out there for like for me the indie scene has been a big thing, like uh, sort of Blades in the Dark, which you know I love. But I wouldn't. I'm not going to suggest Blades in the Dark for reasons we might get to. But I would suggest a game called Inspectors if you ever want to get into the sort of indie side of role playing games. And Inspectors is basically, absolutely, definitely not Ghostbusters the role playing game. <laughs> I was going to say, Ian, it was like you said Inspectors, and I'm like, I don't really want to play people walking about with clipboards. Uh, no, you you play terrible, terrible Ghostbusters. <laughs> basically, basically the idea is that the, the Inspectors is a worldwide ghostbusting franchise and you have decided to set up a franchise in your local town and that could be like Edinburgh or it could be a tiny village in the Highlands and you've decided to set up a ghostbusting franchise and it's it's got a really basic uh, sort of mechanic which allows you to teach people when the GM gets to create stuff and when the players get to create stuff. And in indie role-playing games, it tends to be quite important that the players lead some of the creation. And it teaches that lesson quite well, I think. I think it teaches that part of sort of indie role-playing games pretty well. And it's a very easy sell. 
it's Ghostbusters, the role-playing game. <laughs> what about what about you, Ian? Do you think there's anything else beyond D&D that people should look at? I am, so being a Netrunner fan, I have always wanted to try Fantasy Flight Games' Genesis system, which has a specific Netrunner worldbook for it, but it's not something I've ever got around to trying, which is a shame, because the Genesis system with its custom dice and that kind of thing looks cool and interesting. I believe it works quite well in the Star Wars ones they they put out. They're, they're meant to be quite good. And I think those starter kits are quite good as well. I think that's one of the interesting things we should talk about. Actually. I think, especially as a GM, you should seek out a game that's in a world that you're interested in. Because if you don't, this is all going to fall apart before you begin. You should definitely try and find a game that fits what you like. Even if that game is maybe not the best sort of new game, like new game for new players... If you're interested in it, you're more likely to get it to the table. You're more likely to be interested in it and read it and actually work on it and, and make it happen. What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned Blades in the Dark earlier, which is not a game I've played, but I've bought and have read through several times. Just yes, looking at it me going, too. This looks cool. I'll and... have to come run through and run a game. For... Actually, I might run a game down at Aircon. I might, I might run a game down at Aircon. And you're going to Aircon too, aren't you? I am going to Aircon, Yeah. Yay, we should run Blades. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be very up for that. Yeah. Going back to what you were saying slightly earlier, Ian, about uh, indie RPGs and, and very similar, something that interests you. We've seen over the last couple of years uh, proliferation in the one-page RPG. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think best exemplified by two of the most well-known iterations, which are Honey Heist and Jason's... Oh. Jason Statham's Lovely Holiday. Thank you. And Brian Cranston's big expansion. <laughs> but both of these games, all of these games are from Rowan Rook and Deckard, who are the, also the creators of the Spire RPG. There we go. And as the game suggests, they are on one A4 page. And that's all you need. All, all, all of it, all the rules, everything you need. Yep. For players and GMs, all on the same page. And that is a really nice resource because it doesn't require a lot of materials. So you need some A4 paper, maybe... You maybe have to photocopy it maybe two or three times, and you need a couple of dice. You can also buy Honey Heist on a t-shirt. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> the rules brilliant. for the GM are printed upside down, so only the person wearing the t-shirt, who is assumedly going to be the GM, can read them. Is that right? Apparently. Cool. That's an excellent idea. I really like that. I think the main thing when thinking about starting a new uh, role-playing game as a player or a GM is first, as we've said, Think of something that you're interested in. Think of a setting, think of a world. You know, if it's Warhammer or Netrunner for Ian, or if you like to play Peaky Blinders combined with The Lies of Locke Lamora for Blades in the Dark. Absolutely. And uh, I'm mentioning Warhammer there. The Wofrup star set, the new one, is really good. It's a really nice thing. Wofrup stands for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. That particular one is set in the Warhammer world, which used to be as part of Games Workshop's Warhammer Fantasy Battles line. Commonly referred to as the Old World as opposed to the Age of Sigmar stuff, but there is an Age of Sigmar role-playing game coming as well. And presumably Cubicle 7 are going to do an equally good starter set for it because that seems to be their thing. So I think our core takeaways there are like if you're if you're a new player, yeah, find look at look up local groups, especially if D D, you will definitely find groups to play in. If you're the G if you're gonna take on the responsibilities of being a GM well done to you. It is a tough job, but a very rewarding one. But yeah, seek out a game in a setting or genre that you're really interested in, and that will really help. Even if that game is not necessarily the best for a new GM, if you're interested in it, it'll that'll take you through the sort of maybe the tough bits of system and that kind of thing. And if you want any suggestions from us uh, or anyone else who's like sort of experienced role players, hit me up on Twitter and I can direct you towards people who can answer questions or I'll try and answer them myself. Well, let's move back through to the main studios. Where, where did Jamie go again? He's meant to be doing the Monopoly news. I thought he was getting coffees. He's, yeah. Where's he gone? He's disappeared between between the brainstorm studio and this one. It's like a, it's like a ten meter corridor. Where's he gone? Did you did you not see where he went? I didn't see where he went at all. No, I thought he. I thought he was just behind me, but then I turned around and he wasn't there. Oh dear. Who will do the Monopoly news now? Well, I'm not doing it. <laughs> oh dear. I think as intern, that means I'm demoted to Monopoly newsman. So, we go live to Monopoly. 
Monopoly goes back to the 80s. Right, go with me on this one. Garbage Pail Kids were released 35 years ago as a satire on Cabbage Patch Kids, which were those weird dolls. And now, for their 35th anniversary, USAopoly is bringing out, guess what, an edition of Monopoly so fans can relive the satiric grossness of the trading cards. Player tokens are Zit Goo Tube, Fish Bones, Melting Eyeball, Overflowing Trash Can, Guillotine, and Swirly Dog Poop. Houses are garbage cans, <laughs> and hotels are dumpsters, and this game will play in 60 minutes. USAopoly has announced two more Monopoly versions will also be coming soon. Lilo and Stitch, and Beetlejuice. And just to confirm, there was a comma in there, it's not between Stitch and Beetlejuice, which is a bit of a shame. I, w- I would definitely pay for a Monopoly that was Lilo and Stitch and Beetlejuice all at once. I would absolutely play for that, yep. Yeah, that'd be amazing. I think I think Garbage Pail Kids was definitely an an American thing. Well, I don't think it came over here very much. I don't think so either. I don't, I don't remember it certainly. So the names of the player tokens are making me think of that line from the Warhammer Escape Room, where players will touch, smell, and feel all areas of the ship. <laughs> oh. they very much sound like evil Nurgle creatures, fish bones and melting eyeball and. Sounds gross. Look. Look, can you do the next little couple of bits? I'm just going to see if I can find Jamie, see what's going on. Sure thing. Hopefully he's found the coffee machine as well. That'd be great. So next up in our news is Tabletop Scotland. Tickets are live as you listen to this, unless you're listening to this in a couple of years or something. What am I even doing? Prices are £18, £12 or £10 for the weekend, Saturday or Sunday. Adult tickets with discounts for young adults. Family tickets are available and free entry for 10 and under as previously. As I've been left by the, myself in the studio, this is increasingly going off the rails. Next up, the Patreon shoutouts. We have the executive producers, the Lucky Sparrow Gaming Cafe, lovely people that they are. So now that I've been left alone for far too long, I'm going to go find out what those two are up to. What are you doing packing up? L- l- listen, mate, listen, mate. Right, here's the thing. Um, I... I mean, y- your your room's empty. Yeah, I know it's empty. I've packed it up. Can you not see these cases? What the hell's going on? Uh, what's going on is... Oh, hi, Ian. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I've got coffee here for you. Uh, here. Sorry, I... Uh, but I... not for me. Um, oh, fantastic. Oh, um, Thank you, Jamie. Uh, no worries at all. Uh, Ian, I, I did have coffee for you, but... Um... Uh, it, I think it's in one of these boxes. I'll have a look in a minute. Look, listen. Okay. Boys, listen to this. I am... I've got to go and find myself, okay? Listen, I'm... You're right I'm, there. No, yeah, I know. But I've got to find myself as a gamer. You see, I'm very bad at board games. So I need to learn. Like, to win a game, one must understand, become the game. So I'm off on um, a trip to find myself. So I'm, I'm going to race around Jamaica. Um, I'm going to eat only gold for that. Um, I'm that gonna sounds climb... like a terrible idea, eating only gold. Oh, it'll be fine. I shall be the shiniest pirate you've ever seen. Um, I'm going to go and climb K2 with a clone of myself, and hopefully I won't freeze to death with myself in a tent. Um, oh, I'm going to go for a quick bite at the restaurant at the end of the universe, and then I'm going to go to the planet Arrakis to conquer the planet and control the spice, and then hopefully control the universe. Then, maybe then, I might return. Oh, if I see Sam on my travels, I'll tell you I miss him. Well, what, what am I going to do for a co-host? Uh, Ian? Hello? Congratulations, you're the new co-host. Bye! Oh, very quickly, Ian, you're going to do a fantastic job. Ian, be nice to Ian. I'll be listening. Oh dear. I agree. <laughs>